So half a day and welcome to part two of an overview of pre-employment transition services. We're so glad to have you all with us today. And we're back. So Bren, we'll do quick introductions again. Absolutely. So hi, everybody. Brenda Simmons, and I work with Michael on the um, NTAC C grant, the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, the collaborative. Um, and I work at a George Washington University. So it's great to see you all today. And I'm Michael Storr, also with the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, the collaborative but I work at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte, and we are thrilled to be back with y'all. And it's actually much warmer than it was last month. It's now, and it's 11 o'clock at night here in Williamsburg, Virginia, but it's 65 degrees. So it's much warmer. And Brent, it's probably like 70 in Florida. Yeah, it's it's uh, pretty nice here. It's <laughs> Uh, it's pretty nice here, that's for sure. You know, Michael, I was just thinking, I don't know if any of you all um, are old enough to remember or um, young enough to have seen your uh, parents or grandparents talk about Donnie and Marie Osmond. But Michael, when we were introducing ourselves, I almost wanted to say, um, and Michael's a little bit, you know, instead of a little bit uh, uh, rock and roll, he's, he, you know, a little bit education and I'm a little bit VR. And well, so that's true. <laughs> A little, bit, a little bit VR and a little bit education. So. <laughs> and we cross over a little bit here and there. So Me that's uh, which is part of what we're going to be really highlighting and talking about today. So uh, just to kind of recall from the last time we were together last month, um, we talked about the um, Pre-Employment Transition Services Compendium. Um, we spent some time, we shared that document with you. We went over the overview. Um, and just as a refresher, um, it was this overview guide that provided um, the whys and the how-tos of Pre-Employment Transition Services. Um, so did know if folks, um, we're going to take a quick pause. I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoint for a minute and just open this up. If folks had thoughts, comments um, since last month on the compendium, um, your thoughts in working on IDA secondary transition activities and services and looking at that alignment with your OVR friends um, and pre-employment transition services. So just unmute from wherever you are, if you have any thoughts and uh, CNMI OVR, you're welcome to chime in too, if you have thoughts on the compendium. So we'll give a few minutes of wait time. Don't be shy. <laughs> I think it's good, Michael, just to have that conversation about, did you guys, did it make sense, you know, in terms of how we kind of defined things, you know, the purpose, the intent of pre you know, all those things. Did it, did it seem to make sense within what you had, you all had thought and, and the way you're looking at delivering those services? Hey, I see a couple of things in the in the chat here, Michael. Um, no questions from um, uh, OVR side of the house, and I'm glad you guys think it's a, a pretty good reference. So that's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty, and education folks, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it. I'm sure you have busy, busy schedules, and we're just a little blip in your week, but. If you go back and reflect upon it, it we're going to be diving into today um, more information related to pre employment transition services. So you can think about it. You can get back and uh, put comments in or unmute as we go through today's presentation. So hold on one second. And did want to just highlight again the fact that we are talking about pre-employment transition services and today really diving in more deeply into that discussion. 
Um, but as we talked about when we met the last time, and this is highlighted in the compendium too, is that really um, in looking at the um, pre-employment transition services, it's just one of the services provided by OVR and CNMI. Um, and it is uh, was set up, it does start transition earlier uh, for those students with disabilities. Um, it is short-term in nature. And today we're gonna be highlighting the five required pre-employment transition services. But for students who are eligible uh, and <laughs> that have a disability, OVR provide transition services and they have an IPE um, opposed to that IP, IEP that education folks have. Um, and that really helps to further develop and help them pursue their career interests. Um, and lastly, employment related services um, that really help those eligible students to um, find and acquire, maintain competitive integrated employment. So just to highlight that continuum, and I know, Bren, this is actually your slide, but I'm showing that, you know, I have a little bit of VR too, but if you want to add to that. <laughs> no, Michael, that was perfect. That was, that was perfect. Yeah. We just, we just really wanted to emphasize that, um, with the addition of pre-employment transition services that came out in 2014 out of WIOA, that new legislation, with that new legislation, it really did make um, VR services more like a continuum of services. And I think, Michael, what we're going to emphasize as we continue to move forward, um, it used to be, Michael, when you and I were doing this, and probably, honestly, when we came out, um, you know, or, you know, a few years ago um, to the islands, we were, we were not talking as much about that um, kind of working together as much as we are now. It's like every year, it just keeps getting stronger and stronger. The importance that we're seeing of VR making sure that it's not like a handoff with those students, you know, that the school district doesn't just kind of hand them off to you those last couple of years, um, that it's super important that VR is working with these students really, you know, um, very, very early on, and you're doing that together. So it's not as much a relay race as it is a sack race, right? We're all kind of in it together. And um, I think it's important that VR also knows they've got a whole lot of things in that sack that they can use, not only pre-employment transition services, but as Michael said, transition services and employment related services. So all of those things can be provided to students um, as they are continuing um, to learn and grow and understand what kind of career pathways they want to move forward with. So I, I think it's a great slide, Michael, and it's a great introduction to all the services that can be provided for sure. And for the education folks, it's important that you all know that this really is the continuum of services that OVR can provide to those students with disabilities that you all are working with. Um, that it's not just a once and done service. Um, you know, they will engage in pre-employment transition services, but the transition services and employment related services are something that those students with disabilities and adults with disabilities can continue to access. Um, at, as they're gaining competitive integrated employment. So just kind of keeping that in mind. So with that, we are gonna dive into, and there are five of them, if you recall back a month ago, and if you had a chance to glance at the email Lucille shared with you, um, there are five required employment activities uh, and, and we do have five separate references. So we have job exploration and counseling. We have work-based learning experiences. We have a very long titled one, which is counseling on opportunities for enrollment in comprehensive 
education or post-secondary education programs at institutes of higher education. They could not make that one longer. And basically it's the one preparing those students with disabilities to go on to colleges, universities, institutes of higher education. And then there's workplace readiness training and instruction in self-advocacy. So uh, these are each individual documents and um, you, you have a copy of them that was sent to you as a PDF. These are also available on our website, uh, which is transitionta.org. Um, they're highlighted in multiple places, um, but you know we really wanted to um, share this and, and go over these with you. The other thing to keep in mind as we go over this next section is think about, especially teachers um, that are working on your sites, think about what you do uh, regarding your transition activities and services that you are doing with the students you're working with, uh, what you have been doing, because education folks, we've been doing this for since 2004, so like 20 years, um, IDA passed transition, it's hard to believe. Um, but think about those things that you're doing and then how this aligns with what your OVR um, friends are doing in CNMI. So when we think about the five required employment activities or, or the free of activities, um, you can think of those as sort of that appetizer to the other services that VR or OBR provides. Um, so if you look at these, um, they really do, they, they, they can stand separately, but they also kind of go hand in hand um, as you are working with um, your students and when OBR is. Um, and Bren, I know you'd like to talk about this slide too, because you love your appetizers. So <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about this one. Oh, I do love my appetizers. I think, um, I think Appetizers are an important part of, of your full meal deal, right, Michael? Okay. Um, this kind of what we wanted to describe here, when you look at pre-employment transition services, these really are that early start. They kind of hopefully get students hooked, you know, um, get them excited about what's going to come next. You know, um, whether that's what's going to come next on the menu or what's going to come next in terms of um, career preparation and planning. And oftentimes students, you know, I mean, let's face it, most most kids, they're kind of just looking at tomorrow. Right. Um, they maybe look toward what's going to happen when I graduate, but oftentimes it kind of almost stops there, you know? It's so hard to think what's gonna, what, where do I wanna be when I'm 20? It's like, oh my gosh, I have no idea, you know? And so what we really wanna do is to get students really hooked and thinking about how exciting it is to begin to think about all the opportunities and then all the different things that you might be able to do. You may be able to do more um, than just employment that your mom and dad has done or that your grandparents have done. There might be lots of other opportunities if you're interested, you know? Sometimes we just don't even know what's out there. And so what we're hoping with these pre-employment transition services is that they will give students an opportunity to not only learn more about the different career pathways that may be available, but have an opportunity to practice, um, you know, out there um, in a job situation and really kind of explore what it feels like to work and the difference between what the expectations are when you go to a job and the expectations that you may have on you now. What does that look like? How is that different? You know, so those are all the things that um, we, you know, we talk about with this kind of early start at job exploration and um, exploring all of the different kinds of things that you can do whenever you get older. So yeah. Michael. So when we look at the uh, these five required documents, 
what you're going to notice is that each of them follows a similar pattern. So each of, and, and they address those five areas that we talked about, um, each of them have a section that has definitions, and then there are guiding questions um, that, that help you kind of think through that area. So it's like self-advocacy. Then there's examples of activities that the VR system can do, but also, again, be thinking about education folks. What are you doing around your activities and services that you're providing for students? Then there are key considerations. And then there's a section looking at those student progress and outcome indicators. And then lastly, um, we provide some information regarding curriculum options and additional resources at the very bottom of each one. So those are kind of those key pieces that you can see as you go through each of those five separate resource documents that we shared with you. Um, moving into this next section of this afternoon's presentation, Brent is going to talk through each of these sections using one example of job exploration and counseling, but take it through those steps. So, Brent, over yeah. to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so just kind of an, as an example, and we could go through all of them, what we just don't have time and we'd probably bore you guys to death. So we're just going to go through job exploration counseling, kind of walk through this handout a little bit and um, give you an opportunity to, again, kind of stop us. If you all have any questions, please, please feel free, you know, to, to let us know. So the very first thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that no matter what, um, how you're going to deliver job exploration counseling, and right now I'm going to be talking to OVR staff, right? So no matter how you decide you want to deliver job exploration counseling, whether you as the counselor is going to deliver that directly, or whether maybe you are going to contract out with a provider or another vendor or a community rehab program um, to provide the service, you want to make sure that whoever's doing that service, that they are doing the same thing, right? <laughs> we want to make sure that when we say you're providing job exploration counseling, we're defining that for you. So these are all the major content areas that you should be addressing when you're delivering those services. You want to touch base on whether or not maybe that student needs a vocational or a career interest inventory. Um, talk to them about uh, the labor market. What does the labor market look like, you know, um, on your island? What does that look like? And what does it look like if a student wants to um, move stateside to the United States, you know, to the continental United States? What would that look like? What would jobs in Texas look like? What would jobs in California look like? What are the labor markets there? What are labor markets if you want to be self-employed um, and you want to work remotely? You know, you want to still live in Saipan, but maybe you're going to be working for a large corporation or an entity where their home base is in the continental United States. So what does that look like? So looking at all of those labor market opportunities, in-demand industries and those occupations, those non-traditional employment um, options, and all of the different career pathways that may be available to that student. So when you are providing job exploration counseling, one of the most important things um, that we have learned is that it's not just about asking a student to take an interest inventory, but it's about counseling that student around what the results are from that interest inventory. So they show high in X, Y, and Z interest areas. Talk to them about that. Counsel with that student about them. Kind of coach them through that exploration process. And so um, what would it be like? And, you know, oh my gosh, I don't know. And, you know, my family's always lived here. I don't know what it would be like there. Just kind of talk through all of those kinds of things. What would an opportunity to work in that kind of a career field look like for that student? And let them really reflect 
on how they felt as they were looking through each of those jobs. So I think that's the one thing, Michael, that I wanted to mention um, with regard to job exploration counseling. It's about the students being able to explore the jobs, but please don't just give them a website and tell them to go to that website and you know, check jobs out and here you go. And then you kind of check off and you say, okay, we're good. Yes, you can do that initially, but you've got to circle back around with that student, you know, and talk to them. What did you think? How did you, you know, what, how did you feel when you were exploring that job? Did anything pop up that you didn't realize? Oh my gosh, I had no idea I was going to have to do math in that job or, or whatever it might have been, you know, as they were exploring that job. So it's about that counseling that you're providing. So again, whether it's the VR counselor providing that service or whether you're asking a um, vendor or another contractor to provide that service to the student, make sure that they're really engaged with those students around those activities. Right. And I think we mentioned too last time when we met, when we were talking about the compendium, is that this is, you're all doing this in collaboration with each other. So education folks think about, you know, one of the requirements that you all have is to help that student with transition assessments, looking at what they want to do to, and that really helps you define your <clears throat> post secondary goals. So what type of job that student wants to do, what type of additional training they might need, where they want to live. This goes hand in hand with this particular job exploration counseling. Not that it does hit on the other four too, but the reason I'm mentioning that is I think for the uh, OVR folks, you know, talk to your school folks. What have they done with that student up to this point? in looking at what their interests are, like how did they come up with those post-secondary goals? And conversely, as OVR is working with your students and they're working on things like job exploration and counseling, what are they finding out? And how's that being shared back with the folks in education? Um, because this information should, we should be able to see that in the IEPs as well as the IEE, that back and forth. So just wanted to add that point, Brent. I love that. Yeah. It, we're not doing this in a vacuum. And that was one of the things that I'm hoping that compendium really really emphasized, Michael, and that you guys really caught that from, it's sort of like, yes, pre-employment transition services are the responsibility of VR. That is VR's responsibility, but they are to do that in partnership and in collaboration with education. That was a really big piece too in the law. There's so many doggone places, Michael, that that's highlighted in the law about how VR and education are to work together in coordination and collaboration. And they just describe all of those things, right? So that that I love I love it when you emphasize that because that's really important for sure. Alrighty, so moving on. So remember we said there are definitions, and now we're moving into the guiding questions, Brenda. Yeah. So each of the five required activities has some guiding questions around it because one of the things we think probably. Almost every student could use all five of these, right, Michael? They probably could. Technically, they could they could really benefit from all of them. However, um, there may be some students that really maybe already have an idea what they want to do. They're already really on a great pathway. And so maybe they don't need one or more of those five required activities. So one of the things that we put together um, is if you would like to kind of think about where do I start? I don't know this student, you know, so I'm talking again to OVR, you know, you may not know this student very well at all. Maybe you've never met them. And so when you first sit down and start talking with them, it might be good to have just a few little guiding questions in your back pocket to help lead that conversation. And you can begin to talk with the student and find out whether or not they really even have a general awareness of careers or 
occupations or different, do they even know what a career pathway is? And would they be able to kind of connect those things together? You know, can that student really see how maybe what their skills and abilities are and, you know, whether or not they do really well in English or history or math, how that knowledge and that expertise could relate to future employment opportunities or future training in a post-secondary environment. So beginning to get to know that student and kind of frame some questions around their general awareness of job exploration counseling. And then also, um, has the student been able to actually explore occupations and career pathways? Have they had an opportunity to do that? You know, do if that student needs, for example, any type of accommodation or assistive technology in the classroom, then chances are they might need that type of accommodation or assistive technology or some type of additional supports if they're going to be out in a work setting, you know, in a job. So being able to kind of think about, have they really explored what they might need to help them be successful in a job? You know, have, have they had any kind of a job at all? So those are some good conversations to have. And then finally, um, is that student really prepared to to sit down with you and talk to you about what their career interests are. You know, are they, are they in a position to where they can communicate that with you? You might have to build up a relationship a little bit. You know, I'll tell you, Michael, I know the first time, cause I started, I started as a VR counselor, you guys. And I had probably, I had over, I had over 200 students on my caseload when I first started and trying to kind of get to know those students. I'm telling you that a lot of those those kids could actually talk to me for less than five minutes and they would be fine with it. The only reason they sat there any longer is because they got out of class. You know, um, they really weren't that interested initially in really telling me all what they wanted to do. They didn't know me. They thought maybe I was just another teacher, you know? They didn't know who the heck I was. And so I think part of it is about kind of establishing that rapport. And we're hoping that these guiding questions are not only gonna help you determine if that student needs, for example, job exploration counseling, but also help you begin to identify what kind of really fun activities or lessons that that student might really get psyched about or might really get engaged in because you've got to engage them or you're not going to go anywhere, you know, with this particular activity for sure, you know. And, and again, folks from the education side of this, I mean, these really are geared to our OVR friends as they're looking at you know, implementing the five required pre employment transition services. But for you all, as you're working with your students, these are things to think about. You know, as you're doing your transition plans with students in the schools, think about these questions. And, and just to piggyback on what Bren was talking about, I mean, I think far too often folks just do a, you know, questionnaire with students. What do you want to do? And then they write that down, whether or not that even makes sense for that student. I was in a state last week and they had on the tables, it was a, a conference and they had um, table on the table were hard copies of varying types of interest inventory assessments, one being the self-directed search. I'll be honest, I used that 35 years ago and I saw that sitting there and there's nothing wrong with it necessarily, but that's not an answer. <laughs> like that only gives a little piece of a pie. And there's so much more you need to do and ask and actually work. And, you know, and, and I think a lot of it is building a relationship with that student to show that you're interested in helping them explore what's out there and really, you know, meet reach their dreams and their goals that they want to have. So I, I think for education folks, when you're looking at these five separate documents of the five required pre-employment transition services, 
look at each of these sections, thinking about what you're doing too, and then how that can be done collaboratively with your OVR counterparts. I, I love that, Michael. When you were just mentioning that, I was thinking in my head, so really those career interest inventories or self-directed cert, you know, those kinds of things, those are really just conversation starters, Yes. right? They're just the beginning of the conversation. I, I love that analogy. Okay. So moving on, hang on. So in each of these, um, there are also activities. And, you know, again, and Brent's going to talk more about this, but I think for OVR side, Think about these and think about if you're doing this directly or if you are connecting with a community provider to do some of these services, you know, how can these be incorporated? But likewise, from the education side, thinking about what you're doing and then having that conversation about who is doing what. And it probably is going to look different depending on where you're at. You know, each of your high schools might be slightly different in what they're able to do. Your communities are different depending on which island you're on. So kind of thinking about that piece too, as you're looking at these different activities. Yeah, Michael. And these are just examples of activities. And I'd, I'd love um, in a minute, Michael, we'll kind of go over a couple of these, but then I'd love to stop for a minute and hear, uh, you know, what, what you all are doing. What are some of the activities that you all are doing that you're finding that the students are really interested in around job exploration counseling? And, you know, when you kind of go back, it's it's just about if you're meeting with, sometimes it can be fun, Michael, if you're meeting with a group of students, you've got three or four students or maybe 10, you know, students in the classroom and you're talking with them about different careers I have always thought it was kind of fun. One of the examples we gave here was um, exploring military career pathways, but I also think you could do that in exploring all kinds of career pathways that you could use various clips of movies and ask those students to identify all the different jobs that they see within that clip, you know? And what, what made me think about the military careers was um, Top Gun. That was, you know, when um, the second Top Gun movie came out, Top Gun Maverick, I think that was it, right, Michael? That was the name of it. But, um, you know, you would have the aircraft carrier land, your, the airplane land on the aircraft carrier and you saw all of the different jobs that people did just with that plane landing. It wasn't just the pilot, you know? It was so many different jobs there. And, I know that you all have military bases um, there, and I know that um, you've got lots of folks that are in the military, and you could really bring in some awesome speakers that are um, right there, you know, that you could talk to about those kinds of jobs. Um, but you could also reach out and so many you know, connect with people via Zoom and all kinds of things that you could have these students really connect with individuals and maybe role models. Um, so those are kinds of things that, you know, we would, we would really encourage you all to do in addition to those paper and pencil or online career interest inventories, but really think about all the different ways that you can have different speakers and visitors um, and mentors come in and talk about careers and jobs that they have. You can also, we have had some states that have had a lot of fun creating kind of a career profile scavenger hunt for students um, featuring different jobs in all different types of various um, career pathways. And so there's little things to look for as you're exploring or you're listening to um, a video about a particular job. What are some things that you want that student to be mindful of and to pick up along the way? You know, hey, when you're searching, make sure you look for this and make sure you look for that. And so you can almost make it a, like a little competition um, if you've got a group of students. So that can be kind of fun. So making those activities engaging and fun is what we're really trying to do. Um, so I don't know, Michael, if we want to kind of even stop for a second and sure. see if there, what have you all done that you have found 
um, as you're doing job exploration counseling. Um, and I'll ask OVR, and then also we can ask education as you're doing some of those kinds of very similar um, career exploration activities. What are what do you find in the kids really like to do? And we'll give you a couple minutes of wait time. I did want to highlight number four too. Um, and, and on this slide, where we're talking about really using some of those wonderful online resources that exist. I go back, goodness, I, I just realized, Brenda, th this coming year, I will be doing, have been doing teaching you transition stuff for 40 years. And I can think back we did not have ONET and we didn't have Career Index Plus and we did not have wonderful free websites that are out there that really help you explore jobs and areas with kids. So I did want to really just mention that because I think that use those online resources, you know, even though you are on the Mariana Islands, you have the world truly there to explore different job opportunities. And the other thing I wanted to do, I noticed in chat, a little shout out to Connie Lynn and the OVR folks. Joni had mentioned that OVR has been much more collaborative with teachers. Thanks, Connie Lynn. So thank you, OVR friends. And I think I saw, I could be wrong, back to Brenda's question. I'm going to stop um, sharing the PowerPoint for a minute. And I think maybe the OVR folks unmuted and you wanted to share some of the things you were doing. So go ahead. Hi. Hey. So I've met with a couple of different schools and we did start um, our in-house service of job exploration counseling. So we started off with an assessment that is tailored to the five required activities. They're just um, simple questions with, uh, with job exploration is, uh, do you know what you want to do in the future? And when they say yes, I'm like, are you 100% sure? And then if they said no, I'm like, no, that's okay, we'll, we'll explore more. And so I, let's, uh, there's 10 questions per activity. And so I'm sorry, I don't have the assessment with me. But so an example is I met with a student and he was interested in the military. And this student wasn't sure what branch he wanted to pursue. So, you know, we opened up the iPad and I showed him an overview of the description of the military, the difference between the military services so he narrowed it down and he wanted to join the Marines. So, and then he also said he wasn't prepared. So I told, uh, and he wasn't ready to enlist and he wants to stay here on Saipan until he's ready. And then I talked to him that, you know, there are, you know, you can do active duty or reserve and reserve is when it's not, it's, it's somewhat like a part-time you're in the service for part-time and you could also have a job or go to school. And so he was interested. So he changed his mind and now he's interested in doing the army reserve because it is, he wants to still stay here on Saipan. So now he wants to explore that option. So that's where we are with one of the students, but yeah, I think I would like to continue with this assessment only because it really, uh, is tailored to the five required activities. And then I get a sense of where they're at. Yeah, I, I, right. I love that. I love that, kind of, Lynn. That was such a perfect example of how you start with a couple of questions, right? And then that helps you dive deeper and look at how much farther you've gotten with that student. And now it's like, well, oh yeah, I think kind of military. And I have no idea what branch. Oh, now I think, yeah, Mar Marines. Yeah, I think that's what I want to do. And now you helped them look at even like the part-time or, you know, full-time. Like that is so great. So you've already kind of beginning to kind of narrow that process down and help them really explore that. So that's that's a great example, a great example of that. 
Thank you. And then we have another student who was interested in becoming a baker. And then so we sat down and talked about it. And I asked her, like, so if you want to be a baker and you wanted um to do an internship, where do you think you could, where are the possibilities where you could start as an internship just to learn um, food handling, safety and stuff like that. She was able to name a lot of bakeries and coffee shops. So I figured that she, uh, so that got me knowing where her level is in the job exploration. And she also um, mentioned other things like, uh, like the appliances that she would need or that she would uh, recognize in a, a food industry or particularly in a coffee shop because that's where she wants to start off in. But she does want to bake desserts and everything. And she said, I want to make cute, adorable um, treats and also have gluten-free options. So <laughs> I figured she didn't really need job expiration, but uh, so... The other things that I know she may, maybe need is the post-secondary counseling, because mm -hmm. when I asked her, um, do you know what kind of financial aid is available? And she only mentioned FAFSA. So in the transition plan, I shared with the PSS, uh, I mean, with the her contact teacher, was that uh, to we should include information about Sinamai and Shefa. And yep, so some of the teachers already gave me feedback and they they agreed on a lot of things and they liked it. And some of them also uh, provided suggestions and inputs, which helped me update the transition plan for the students. That's great. Oh my gosh, that's another really, really good example. And, you know, so I'm just thinking too, Connie Lent, like I love where you are going with this. All of these options are so good. I'm also thinking about, you know, then just work-based learning and a work-based learning experience to go into one of those co coffee shops, you know, um, to where, there could maybe be an opportunity for paid work-based learning for her to really get some experience, you know, doing that, like that would be super exciting. And then if she really liked that, you know, a lot of times people think of apprenticeships as something to do with a skilled trade that is like plumbing or electrical or something like that. But it can vary, very much so. An apprenticeship can be around bakery too and pastries and, you know, all those kinds of things. And so anything, you know, that um, we can also help or maybe work with some of your workforce partners, you know, yes. there on Saipan to see what kinds of uh, apprenticeship opportunities they might have. And this kind of goes to uh, kind of along that continuum, right, Michael, that we were talking right. about where you just explore a little bit and maybe do work-based learning as a pre activity, but then you can move more toward an apprenticeship or an internship or on the job training along that continuum. And that could be a VR transition service, you know, as you're moving along along the way. And then also absolutely post-secondary education and training if that's appropriate as well. So love, love that. Exciting. Yeah. So Lucille, you look like you have something to add. You put your um, camera on. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Ms. Connellan. She's been working great with our teachers, our students. Uh, we did bring on Mr. Brandon Nicholas again, you know. Uh, so we're working around that area of trying to see if our students, you know, work with working with Priet, by the time they're in the senior, just uh, junior, senior year, they can start getting that on the job training under co-op program, but again, would still be covered under pre-eds. So uh, we we do have a lot of goals that we want to work on. Um, you know, with of course the teacher support, we're wanting to see this um, happening in the future. So we originally were trying to shoot for our seniors this year, but the time's just coming around, you know, and it's almost summer. So we'll probably try to get things in place and we'll try for next school year. Yeah, that's great. So really, 
Other folks on the call, the teachers in various high schools, what type of activities have you been doing around looking at career job exploration with the students you work with? Looks like Cynthia, you may have unmuted. Maybe. <laughs> Or if anybody else wants to share, what types of things have you been doing with the students that you work with to help them explore different jobs, what's out there? Hi, Mike. So hey. this is Dorlin. Hey, Dorlin. Hi. So what we do here at uh, RHI is um, we use the um, ASVAB Career Development Guide. And mm -hmm. with this, it has a bunch of questions that ask about, you know, the rec what they like to do for recreation. If they had, if they were given, um, you know, like a scenario, if they were given an opportunity to do painting, would they want to do that and all of that? So there's about fifty questions, I believe, and we go through with each with the kids. And so based on that, there's kind of like. Um, you know, it shows what their uh, greatest strengths are, um, one, two, and three, what their top three great uh, strengths. And so with that, um, we we help the kids to uh, explore the different career opportunities based on their strengths. And so, um, you know, we will read it with them and then they'll say, oh, no, I don't think I would like to do that. Or, you know, uh, what about this? And then it also, sh also shows how much math is needed, how much English is needed for them to do the, these careers. And so um, that's what we do with our kids with the, you know, in job exploration and stuff. And so some of the things that that pops up with their jobs, it kind of surprises them and say, you know, oh, I think I would like to go, uh, you know, explore this type of of, uh, of career or employment, you know, because sometimes when we get them, they don't know what they want to do. They don't know where they want to start. So right. we started out with them and then, you know, along the lines, you know, they will kind of um, see the various opportunities that are there. Yeah, that's great. And, and that's an excellent example. And you're right. I mean, that's the whole point of why we're all doing this, because most kids, most students you're working with, they don't really know what they want to do or they might. You know, a lot of them they see either it's their favorite singer or somebody that they see in movies or on TV, uh, but it's really helping them to find that. So, Doralyn, thank you so much for sharing that. Anyone else want to share? I know you have a lot of good things going on in your schools. Don't be shy. This is Richard from uh, Tegman High School. Go ahead, Richard. Um, we like to start with our kids a little bit young here because we do the uh, transition and advocacy class mm -hmm. where we're teaching kids how to uh, become advocates. And then in that class, we kind of use just a simple teacher-made interest survey that gets their foot in the door and what uh, path they want to take and whether or not it's, you know, post-secondary education or um, employment. And But the, a lot of the kids that choose employment, we just kind of do a one-to-one, -one, you know, we use the O-Net, we kind of explore things that are out there, and then we kind of shift into um, what's real for us here on the island, because I know a lot of our kids, uh, they're very afraid of leaving the island, they, they just want to stay home, and so we, we, we use the things that we have here, which is the co-op, um, so, you know, we focus on in their, in their junior and sophomore classes, we focus on academics. So that way, come senior year, co-op is just one semester. We can enroll them twice in that co-op class so that they can, you know, have the opportunity to get two types of uh, on-the-job training. Right. What 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 year? What grade do you start the? Is it a transition class? You were saying that you all run. We used to do it at the 12, when we, when I first started, we were at 12th grade, but I saw that it's a little too late. So we started yeah. at the ninth grade level. Oh. Um, all the ninth grade level students that are in the program are required to take, I, I mean, I make them, I make it a requirement to take the course. That way they make that connection with the department. And then they, you know, they have their first taste of life after high school transition. 
That's excellent. That it's great that you do that. I mean, because that is so vital that you're starting that conversation early. It sounds like you have a great process. And, and what high school are you all from again? Tagman High School. Tagman, really. That's can, great. I, can I ask a question? Yep, by all means, go ahead. So Richard, are they only allowed two semesters of the co-op or? Uh, uh, because I, I, I'm representing uh, Tinian and Ann Daouk, and so uh, we have a student that transferred into Daouk that thought we could get job placement for, but they said that he had already had two semesters or, or grading periods of uh, co-op. So just asking. Two or more? You're talking if I've, I've tried two or more? I'm, I'm saying, can they have more than two semesters of co-op? I'm, I'm not too sure. Okay. Who's the most I've gotten the kid because we're also dealing with the uh, credit requirement for graduation. Mm -hmm. That's well, a good question. I back to Lucille, maybe find that one out. <laughs> well, in, in at our school, we kind of, so as long as they take the cooperative education one, which is the, um, not the training part, just the educational part, the soft skills and all of that, um, they are allowed to take the co-op two, which is the training part. And for us, we, you know, as long as they are still meeting their graduation requirements and taking all the credit, the classes needed, then we continue to put them in. So I actually have yeah. a student who's in the 10th grade who we, we fit in her, uh, her co-op class, um, along with her, all her, um, academics all her required classes. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's limited as long as they're, uh, it's not interrupting the courses that that's needed for graduation. Cool. Yeah. Th thank you, Dorlin. Here at Kegman I, they allow, they start, we start at 11. Uh, the teacher says we start at 11, but you know, once you put in the IEP, you can start whenever you want. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is true. That is true. Well, thank you all. Um, great discussion. I don't want to, if anybody else has anything they want to add before we move on. You know, I, I love this, Michael, because this is an opportunity where you really talk about where the what it really looks like at that particular high school, you know? And I love the fact that many of you all on the education side are doing those interest inventories. You're doing this great career exploration. And then this is something that the earlier you do that with the students, then OVR comes in and can just build on that, right? I mean, I, I, love, I love that. And, you know, I was thinking, Michael, as... Richard and, um, you know, everybody was talking here. I was thinking, you know, I know that academic credit requirements are definitely a thing, you know, and you have to be mindful of that. But that's the other good thing about OVR, being able to come in and maybe do some things with the students after school or on the weekends, you know, where they can continue to explore and do some things where they're not being taken out of class, you know? Um, so those are some really exciting things to think about how you might get creative, you know? Um, we've had some school districts, right, Michael, um, that will do some kind of job club or kind of some mm -hmm. really cool things after school, you know, immediately after school, and they'll have a group of students, you know, and that way it's not taking away from their other academic coursework and their credit requirements, but they can build on this career exploration. So um, I think the sky's the limit, really, in terms of, um, Lucille, what is allowable for education, what all you all can see them doing, and OVR, what what you all can, you know, have the time to do. <laughs> kind of, Lynn, you, you, you know, you're only one person, I know, but um, you may have some really good additional support from some other VR counselors there. So. Can I say something again? Oh, yeah, by all means, go ahead. Okay, you know, sometimes with our individuals that are at our alternative facility, the uh, job placements and the opportunities for them to work are the only things that really sustain them staying in school. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have some that don't want to live at home anymore. And so getting a part time job is really important for them. And so, you know, somewhere along the line, we have to make sure that that as we're driving towards having them to be more successful in life academically, that if work is is that priority for them, then we have to find a balance because many times uh, uh, some of our students will choose to leave school and go ahead and get a job. And so when we start putting limitations on that, that uh, opportunities for them, then uh, if they want to be independent, if they want to uh, do other things outside of uh, education because they don't want to live at home anymore, then most of them are going to choose to drop out. So we have to find that fine, fine balance or line in between to make sure that we help to uh, sustain them academically and towards a career choice. No, that, that's a great point. And I think looking at some creative ways of having that student, like your co-op experiences or your paid work experiences and you know, are there ways to give credit for that? Count those classes. And again, every state is different that we work with, but some are much more flexible in looking at what students can receive credit for. And to your point, it may be keeping that student, allowing them to stay in school and graduate with a diploma, which is going to make such a difference for them career-wise for the yeah. future. So excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, sir. Wow. All righty. Well, thank you all for the conversation. And I don't mean to stop it. If you all have more things you want to say, we are going to move on to our next slide, but please jump in and continue the discussion. And with that, Bren, I am going to go ahead and move back. And thank you for sharing all of the things you are doing on CNMI around career exploration. Uh, job exploration, counseling. And with that, hang on. We're going to yeah. move into the key consideration slide. Yeah. And I think this one was just, um, was just kind of a reminder, you know, it was just a reminder slide, Michael, you know, um, that uh, VR um, is primarily the entity that can provide or arrange for the provision of job exploration counseling. But again, you're doing that in collaboration with the local education agency. And I think primarily um, one of the things we wanted to touch base on this one is that not only just for the sake of collaboration, but also to make sure you're not duplicating services. Because for some of you all, oh my gosh, Michael, just listening to everybody talking, it sounds like the teachers may already have been given, given the students some really great interest inventories and some really great exploration opportunities, some conversations, these co-ops. What are you all doing in these co-ops and what kinds of um, things are the students already learning that VR does not need to duplicate or repeat, you know, um, they can just kind of build on what you've already learned about that student. So this has been really valuable information and what you do with one student and how far you can get with one student in the classroom is that one student, right? It may not look exactly the same for another student. Another student may need a lot more time to explore that. And, and as we just learned, some students, it's like, don't take too long because they will have dropped out of school. Like we've got to grab a hold of them quickly and we've got to do whatever we can to keep them in. That was such, thank you. That was such good conversation. So um, I, I think, Michael, this, you know, these are just these kind of key considerations to think about how to keep the students engaged. You all are already learning that. And I would just, I would just um, say to our OVR friends, kind of listen to what the teachers can tell you about these students because they know them. They've been working with them. They know what's kind of working. They know how to kind of keep them engaged and just continue to piggyback on the great work that they are already doing. And if they are like, oh my gosh, I really wish I had more time to work with this young man or this young lady or this student in this area because they're really excited about it, 
listen to them, have them share with you what they think that student needs. And then you just piggyback right up on that, you know, and build on that. Right, Michael? Yeah, definitely. And the last bullet on the key considerations, I think is really important to highlight too, is to really engage that student in this process and to really get them to start to think about, you know, what their future is and what their goals are and what they want to work on. And if they do have an experience, say they have a work-based learning experience and they're in the community, that they reflect on how well they're doing. You know, and some of the best models of that have the teacher or whoever the job coach is, they reflect on how that student's doing, the employer does, and the student does. And then look at that as a comparison. Um, Because oftentimes students aren't aware of what they're doing either. And oftentimes it's that they don't think they're doing as well as they are. Sometimes it's the other way around. But I'm only mentioning that because I think that engagement and having them really driving this and being involved is so important um, as we're working through all this. And and the relationships make such a difference. Yeah. And and what you all, well, many things that you said really resonated, I felt, but also you talked about really meeting the students where they are. Mm -hmm. Some students, it is scary to think about leaving the island. They don't want to go off island. They want to stay within their community. And so meet that student where they are. Look at those jobs that are just there within the island, within that community. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know? Sometimes it is too scary to think about branching off and and looking at something else. You know, this is where I feel safe. This is where I feel comfortable right now. And I think that's a great place to start, you know? So I, I love that, I love that, yeah. So the next slide's talking about student progress and outcome indicators. So again, when you're looking at, in just this example of job exploration and counseling, um, do want to mention again that all of the other four pre-employment transition services follow the same pattern. So Brent, if you want to talk a little bit about this one. Yeah. So in addition to trying to determine which of these five required activities the student needs and exactly how you want to explore, for example, job exploration counseling, what activities you want to do with them, how you want to to, um, kind of explore this particular area. In addition to that, you are going to want to make sure that whatever activities you're doing with those students, whatever work you're doing with them, you have a way that you're going to be able to measure that student's participation. Um, How are you going to measure their progress? Are you going to come in um, once a week? Are you going to come in once a month? Um, If so, are you going to meet with that student for an hour? When you meet with that student, what are the expectation levels? What are the expected outcomes um, that you're hoping to achieve with that student. So I think that's really, really an important piece to begin to kind of sit down and identify and evaluate that. And I think, Michael, we we maybe had a hand go up, so I want to... I saw you. that, and um, did someone have a question? And I don't know where the hand, or maybe the hand went up and it went back down again. <laughs> well, let's give folks a minute to unmute, because I didn't see where that came from. I think it might have been a slip of the mouse, but okay. Okay, go ahead, Brand. Okay, already we'll stop stop us again because I I sure don't want to um don't want to miss anybody because this is good conversation. But I guess you know, kind of going back to and again, so OVR when you are out there and you're providing these services, you definitely want to have a way that you are going to be able to measure that student's um, progress and their outcomes. You don't have to give them a letter grade, (laughs) you know, like the schools do, but you do have to have a way that you're going to evaluate and document that student's progress um, because you need to know, oh my gosh, how, how do I continue to provide job exploration counseling all semester? Do I do it all year? 
And I think the answer to that is going to be different based upon how that student is doing. And so one of the things that we did within these handouts is we gave you some examples of what might be some outcome indicators. What might be some ways that you could begin to ask um, kind of what do you expect of that student um, around job exploration counseling, for example? What do you expect them to know and be able to do? And so that may be one way that you're gonna be able to kind of measure that. And oftentimes we will see people kind of give um, pre and post surveys or pre and post inventories to the students so that when they start working with them, they'd be like, hey, do you know how to do this? Do you know how to do that? Boom, boom, boom. And then you kind of talk with them and kind of get a feel for what they're comfortable with. That's going to help guide you in terms of what activities to do with them. But it's also going to help you be able to, after you've been talking with that student for two or three months and you've been working with them and doing these fun activities, then you can kind of come in again and say, Ooh, okay, now can you do X, Y, and Z? And then you can begin to kind of measure that student's progress and what they're learning over time. And um, as Michael was saying, it, it's so important not only to keep those students engaged, but that they are really interactive and they have a voice in what is happening. You know, that they have a very strong, informed voice in what activities you're doing with them. And that's an opportunity just in and of itself to practice advocacy. I think that was mentioned a, a little bit ago too, Michael, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think advocacy wraps itself around all of these activities. Um, but I think that's really, really important, especially as that student is reflecting. And sometimes it's okay. You know, Michael and I have a hard time sitting and waiting for you all to talk to. We want to jump right in, right? You know, because that little bit of pause, sometimes it, it feels uneasy for us. But it's okay if the student, if it takes them a few minutes before they feel like they can really reflect on how they felt about that activity or what they thought or what they learned, that's okay. Give them an opportunity to give them a little grace and that opportunity to, to really feel comfortable. And they may not say a whole lot at the very beginning, but maybe next month as you're working with them, they're going to know you a little bit more. They're going to feel more comfortable. And then they're going to feel like they can, they can really share a little bit more about how they felt about that particular activity. The other thing I think that is important, it's not just the student engagement, but also the engagement of you all as part of that student's IEP team, the parents, the family members, you know, um, if you can engage um, some of the family members and some of these activities, you know, like, hey, I want you to go home and do X, Y, and Z, or check out maybe interview um, your grandfather or, you know, your mother and find out what they're doing and what do they like about their job, et cetera, et cetera. You can just come up with all kinds of things that you can think of that you might be able to do to kind of involve and engage the family as well. So um, I, I think, Michael, that was kind of the big thing that I wanted mm -hmm. to hit on um, with, with regard to this piece. And then if you go to the next slide, I think it gives you an example. Yeah, so this is an example, <laughs> excuse me, of uh, what I was saying in terms of being able to check and see if the student is able to identify reasons to go to work. Can they tell you what are some good reasons to be able to go out and go to work? You know, um, can you identify at least three different career choices? Can you describe jobs of your various family members? And you can kind of, I don't, I won't read through all of those um, for you, but you can kind of just look and you can come think of something else. These are, are not the only things. We just wanted to give you some examples of what might be some learning objectives or outcome indicators that you could begin to put together that you could measure that student's progress. Okay. And when you um, look again at all of all five of the pre <coughs> the pre documents we're sharing with you, they each have this section 
So mm -hmm. it, it's a nice thing to take a step back. And, you know, I think for school folks, as you are working and you're helping your students figure out those three post-secondary goal areas. So again, you know, going what type of competitive integrated employment they want, where do they want to go to school? Where do they want to live? You could take a step back and look at these. This could really help guide those discussions too that you're having. So kind of like a goal purpose. And as we said, this is really meant to be this back and forth with you all in schools as well as with your OVR partners. Brady. Yeah, and these were just, um, we just kind of wanted you all to know that on our NTACC website, there are some additional um, curricula, um, you know, um, options that you all might want to be able to explore when you go into that NTACC website and you kind of, or you can just this particular PowerPoint, Michael, they can click on this and it, that link takes them directly there. Now you're probably going to have to log in again, you know, um, but um, if you've already kind of logged in before and you've got a password, your username, just log right back in and hopefully you'll be able to do that. Is it taking you, Michael, or no? Let's see. I think it is. So I'm going to have to think the way I have this set up. Let's see if it slides over. It is sliding over. Wonderful. <laughs> and it does take you there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So again, you all may have some great curricula that you're using already. Um, and I really am using curricula in kind of the broad sense of the word. Teachers, forgive me. You know, it's a, it's a little bit broader um, than, than I know curricula that you all have to use. But these are just really fun um activities, really. They're, they're almost activities that you can use with students. And um, we wanted to share these with you because you don't have to, you know, come up with something all on your own, but you can just kind of explore these options um, for how you might be able to deliver these services and see what works. You know, if there's, there might be a couple of lessons from one curricula that you really, really like that the kids are really excited about. And then there might be in a couple others from another one, you know, um, uh, I can't remember which one it was, Michael, but I know for March, um, they had a lot of the students were excited about filling out brackets for basketball yeah, yeah, for yeah, March yeah. Madness. And right. so they did a whole career pathway exploration around March Madness on career exploration and brackets for careers, you know? Um, and teachers are some of the most creative people in the entire world. And so I know that there might be some really great ideas that you all may have. Um, th and if you don't have time to do that in your classroom, but you think this might be a really great fun activity um, that you would love to see if maybe OVR would be able to do with your students, see. You know, um, if this is not something that is already a part of your curricula, and help me if I'm saying this right, Michael, but if it's not already a part of your curricula that you're doing with your students, but you think, oh my gosh, I've seen this, I've heard about it, I've always thought this would be really cool, but we just have no way to pack it in to any of our our curricula or our transition that we're doing with the students, but I think it would be great they can share that with OVR, right, Michael? Right. And, and maybe OVR could do it because if it's not something that you are already doing in the school, you know, it's then it wouldn't be duplication. Right. Then it might be something, you know, that OVR might be able to do with that student. So, so did just want to share too. Um, so besides the curriculum that you can find of these different, their activities too. I mean, they're, they're really yeah. cool things. When you scroll down, because we, you all were talking about different types of interest inventories that you have used. These are some additional suggestions. But then what I really like is you go down here, there are some really wonderful, and you all mentioned, I believe someone had to mention ONET and that you were using and talking about some other things. But on this particular part of this page of the website, 
these are all really cool ways to explore jobs. Um, and some of them, like Road Trip Nation, it's actually, a, it's on YouTube. And it's really, it, it's really cool. I mean, it's these young folks and they go off in a big van, a, a bus, actually it's not a van, it's a bus. It's a big bus. And they travel across um, the, the continental United States and they interview people and they're famous people and they talk about jobs. Um, as well as some of these others where they go in and you can actually watch careers and jobs and show those options. So it really, this is quite the wonder. And then there's additional resources down below. So just wanted to mention that, and, and these exist for all five, again, of the five required pre-employment transition services. So you can find all of these. Um, so anyhow, just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, and I think, Michael, what we were kind of mentioning on this slide too is that not only are the options out there, but probably one of the most important things is for OVR and the teachers to have conversations about these resources and talk to each other about what you think might be the, one of the best resources to use with these particular students and how, what, what OVR learns about that student also needs to be shared back with the school district. And make, so it's really important that not only you all, um, teachers share with VR what you know about that student, but as OVR is working with that student, and it sounds like Connie Lynn's definitely doing this already, but share that information back with you all, because maybe that will help support um, the direction you want to go, goals, objectives, some of the things you want to do in that student's IEP or 504 plan. So all of these things can kind of just help work and inform each other as you're working together for that student. Great, thank you. So we wanted to share this with you um, and we've been hitting, talking about this, hitting around this concept, but it's really looking at, and what this um, slide is showing, it's one way of mapping or looking at what you all are doing in your high schools, your middle schools, with the students you're working with, and then looking at what OVR is doing. So it's taking those five required pre-employment transition services, for example, they're written across the top, and really going and looking at, all right, these are all these different activities that could be going on. What are we doing in the school around these? And what is OVR supporting either directly or with a provider agency in completing? And then it looks at the different grades that that student is in school. The thing in looking at this too is it's really something that needs to be done probably for each high school because I'm sure there's different things that you are doing depending on the high school you are in. Um, and your communities are different, right? With the three islands, you, you do things differently. So this is something that's really helpful to do and to start to think about. Um, we, we are talking um, possibly, and, and I'll mention it on the next slide, we talked about what's coming up next, um, possibly um, doing something in face-to-face -face with professional development. And this would be a great, mapping way of looking at that to really sit down and see what you all are doing in your high school around secondary transition, really focusing in on these five areas. And, and to be honest, these five areas are what you all have been doing under IDEA transition services and activities, but then seeing what OVR does and how you can do this collaboratively um, and really supporting the best way you can their students with disabilities. I didn't know if you have anything to add, Brent. <laughs> no, that was perfect. That was okay. Perfect. So just it kind of to take a step back, pause and think. Um, it's in, in what you're working with your students in your schools, right? In your classes, in your high schools, in the communities that you're living in, thinking about how do your current work practices support 
both pre-employment transition services and then what you're doing in the school under IDA transition services. And it sounds like that's been strengthened greatly this year, um, thanks to Connie Lynn and the other people at OVR. But think about how are you connecting? Um, and I think probably that next bullet is really important. How are you ensuring that you're not duplicating, right? What you're doing in school with what OVR is doing, keeping that in mind. Um, and then really that students are given information about, yes, there's pre-employment transition services and that's for potentially eligible students, but that as we were mentioning, the very beginning, we talked about that continuum of services with OVR, there are transition services and employment services and really talking about that student applying for OVR services um, because there's a lot more, there's added features. It's <laughs> like a subscription to Netflix. It's There's added features that you can get, right? With OVR, if that student applies and is found eligible for services. So really having an understanding and supporting that. Then really thinking about moving forward. Now it's March 18th. We know the year is quickly, quickly moving. It's gonna be June before we know it and it'll be summer. Um, but thinking about, all right, the rest of this year, but then projecting to next year. So looking at 24, 25, that school year, what things could you be doing differently? How could you work more collaboratively with your OBR and other community partners? Um, and then thinking about all of these resources, not just really the job exploration and counseling that we went over today, but the other areas and how could you really use these resources? Yeah, and you know, Michael, I think about as you were talking, how important the academics are, right? History and English and math and the sciences. Absolutely, that's important. But my goodness, Michael, we cannot forget about transition and how important transition, and, and I would say for all students, especially students with disabilities, that particular piece and understanding transition and what am I going to do and how do I navigate this world and all of the things that you all teach around that are so important. You know, I, I, we've got to find a way to get that back into that student's day, you know. Definitely. Um, and well, and how you can do things. I mean, I guess when you're thinking about the academics, how that crossover can occur. And again, we work with a lot of different folks in a lot of different states and territories. Um, but there are some schools and, and some high schools that, for example, their English department works real closely with their transition folks. So when they have to write their essay or term paper, they do it on career paths. It's things that they might be interested in doing. They align these activities with those academic courses. So that's something else to think about. You know, are there ways to do crossover with the students to really engage them, you know, across the board, not just in a separate class when somebody pulls them out? Um, so, again, just thinking outside the box, thinking about some alternatives. With that, this does kind of wrap us up with our formal presentation for this afternoon. Uh, we did want to remind folks, we do have one more of these virtual events um, coming up. And this planning and discussion that we have coming up for next month on April 22nd is really to help. There is a team coming to something that we're having in May um, called the Capacity Building Institute, or CBI. And it's something where Brenda and I work at the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, the collaborative. Um, this is something that uh, we're helping to support along with our coworkers. We have folks coming from 46 states and territories to work on their planning. But the idea of the planning is that it's not just that team that's coming. So I know Lucille's coming. There's a couple teachers. There's a couple of folks, I believe, from OVR coming. But they're just representing you all, right? And, and they're even, we're calling them delegates as they come. So 
What we'd really like to do on our April 22nd meeting is to help them um, at, think about, you know, what are the needs and where you're at. And Lucille, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I don't know, Lucille, if it would be helpful to share with your, um, like with all the folks on this meeting, so the teachers, and we could share it with our, your OVR counterparts. Um, we do have a, a pre-assessment that we have folks doing. Um, one of the, um, and, and we have it in a couple of different formats, and I think I attached it to what I sent you, but we also have the capacity to put that into um, just kind of an online survey. So it's an easier way of folks can just kind of click through it. Um, that's something that we could set up and I could share if you think that would be helpful. Um, if we got that out to folks and say they were able to get that back to us, like, oh, I don't know, maybe around the 15th or the 12th of April would give us a chance to look at that. Um, that's something we can do. And actually, Bren, that's something that Missy did for our work that we're doing with uh, another state that we're work Missy and I are working. And she put actually put it into an online survey format. So I could like talk to her about getting that set up for you all. Lucille, is that something you think you might like to have? That would be great. Okay. That would help us out a lot. Um, so what I will do is I'll, I'll shoot Missy a, a note and see if we can get that set up for you all. And then that could really help Bren and I, as we're helping you discuss this on the 22nd, we would at least have input from folks. Now, what that means folks on the call, it's going to take about 15, 20 minutes to go in and click through these different questions that are there. But I think that might be helpful in helping the team plan on what would be most beneficial to you as classroom teachers, as well as to OVR counterparts. So we will work on getting that set up for y'all. Um, and then the other thing that I mentioned this earlier, there is the potential that we may be coming in person sometime in August. Um, and if we do that, that mapping piece that I we just talked about a minute or two ago, that's something that I think would be really helpful to do on site, as well as some other, I think, just cross uh, collaborative discussions with your partners, uh, particularly those from OBR. So with that, we do want to thank you for joining us on this March 18th afternoon. And if there's any other questions y'all have. Yeah, I loved the discussion earlier. If any you all want to share anything else. And please do. I'll share one more thing. Thank you. And I love I love that you are Star Lord. Star Lord. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I really. I, I just I was like, I was, you know, you, you just put me into the galaxy. But go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking out. I was trying to figure out how to change my name, and I said, "Never mind. We'll just leave it." No, That's I love AKA Star Lord. It here cracks me up. So go ahead, Star Lord. <laughs> but I just, you know, think going back to what you said about thinking outside of the box. One of the things that I've um, taken on here at the school is teaching a or taking a class, which is we call it head uh, headquarters, but it's it's like a homeroom class. And uh, I took it on because we were short, they were short of teachers. So, you know, I said, let me have it, but I have to include uh, a lot of my kids in the, in the class. So uh, it worked out for us. We, we kind of did a whole, like a month long project where I assigned uh, students into different groups, take, tackling the, um, the employment, uh, post-secondary and you know a lot of the kids in that class wanted to do uh, the military getting into the military mm -hmm. and so they broke into those three groups and I had a couple of my kids in each group and they you know they dove into the research and they found out you know the difference between a uh, um, 
high paying job versus minimum wage job here on the island. Um, we found out the, the military people, they found out the different um, score levels on the ASVAB and what it took to uh, get into the military. Um, the college, the post-secondary kids, man, they were they, they did awesome. They got a guest speaker from the local college here to come to the class. And so, uh, you know, I was just thinking about outside the box. Um, mm -hmm. Those kind of things maybe fall into that category. Yeah, great example. Yeah. Thank Absolutely, you. they fall in that category. I love that. I love those ideas. Yeah. Yeah, it's it was a home HQ. I mean, a um, a homeroom class where last semester they gave us an hour. This semester they only give us uh, it was an hour, and we were they got a grade, a point five grade, a point five credit, point two five credit. This semester. Uh, they took it away and said, no credit, no grade. <laughs> and they gave us 20 minutes just to oh. kind of check attendance and do pep talks and oh. that kind of stuff. So That's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, it's, it's Lucille. Not, it's great work, but you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> no, I was just going to, I was going to give Lucille a hard time. I'm like, okay, what <laughs> happened there? <laughs> not I, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> that was at our school level. The, the a lot of teachers were complaining about it, so we took a survey, and uh, the teachers kind of felt that way, and so that's what we were given. Yes, it it put you in that situation, but maybe. Yes. Maybe, <laughs> but, maybe. But I love where you're. I love what you're thinking, you know, and I love where you're wanting to go, and I think. It could even be, Lucille, like it could be a conversation about what can we do differently, mm -hmm. you know, within within each individual high school or maybe together. I mean, I don't know, you know, but what would be some really creative different ways to go about, you know, working with these students? So, yeah, I, that's a conversation I need to bring up to our director to see. I know with uh, Mr. Richard at Kamen High, it was a credit class, but like he said, now it's no credit class. So, you know, uh, we've been talking, having those type of conversations with the director. So maybe we need to bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Anyone else have anything you want to either add or jump in? And just feel free. Uh, to... yeah, Go ahead, Susie. Jennifer from Saipan Southern. Um, so um, Lucilla and I spoke about this, and she recommended I talk to you. So I have a student who's um, uh, being evaluated. I'm supposed to set the goals for the transition goals. He's uh, 16 years old. Um, he'll be 16 years old next month, and um, but he's still being evaluated by the school psychologist, and also I need I needed OVR to Miss Connie to meet him uh, first, so I'm still working on his transition goals. So this this student, his situation is uh, he is unable to perform at the same level as his peers, his pre primer, and uh, he is unable to access grade level. Uh, curriculum and also he needs assistance in all academics and social communications and functions also his disability affects his involvement and progression and access in the general education and he may not demonstrate interest he doesn't demonstrate interest in social interactions and he is uncomfortable in crowded environment and he needs support in um, navigating him around the school and everything that he does even eating and to be putting his trash to throw his trash or put his plate in the sink he needs prompting and assistance so for this particular student how do i um, set goals for transition goals for him and I talked to the parents and even the parents are like, they need our help in that area. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I in mean, is there a, like a general goal that covers or a specific goals for this type of students? Yeah, it, it sounds like I, I mean in, in for students that have more complex support needs, which the student definitely would fit under. Um, there, there's person-centered planning or person-driven planning. It, it, it's a it's a way of looking at what that student does like to do or, or what what they prefer and it and it would be it, it's a it's a planning process it, it's a way of looking at that um but i think it, you really need to um, think about you know what what does that student do in their home um what have they you know what types of things can they do independently i mean you you said all the things that that student couldn't do but what can they do and then really looking at um, you know how that could then link to some type of engagement um, once they they leave school. Um, there's different levels of of involvement in competitive integrated employment. So there's supported employment. There, there's customizing that. But I guess it, it it really comes down to kind of going back and looking at you know what does that if if you can determine what does the student like to do. Like what are their abilities? Um, what do they, um, you know, and it could be, I don't know what that student likes to do in their free time, but to kind of capitalize on some of those things. Uh, because it's going to have to be different than what you're doing with a lot of the other students that you're working with. Right. Yeah, I was thinking that too, Michael. And, you know, Susie, another thing, you know, with the parents right now, it's feeling very overwhelming. Have any of you ever talked with parents and they don't they don't even have an idea of what their students might be able to do, their child might be able to do, right? They don't even kind of dream big for their kids, you know? It's sometimes very hard for parents to step out of that, what, and, and they do the same thing, Michael. They kind of see what their child has difficulty with, and it's hard for them to imagine that their child would ever be able to do any kind of work. And so breaking it down kind of into more accessible steps, Michael, I loved like, but what are some things that that individual is able to, is able to do, whether it's by themselves, or with support, right? What are they able to do, even if it's with support, you know, around school or at home and kind of begin to kind of just build from there. So I don't know, Michael, that there's some general transition goal that you could really come up with. It's just trying to kind of home in on helping that, that student begin to carve out you know, an idea for a pathway, right? And I know, and I think Lucille, and I'm going to just jump in there and somebody else can too. I'm not sure what types of supports you have uh, in the Marion Islands for individuals with more complex needs mm -hmm. as adults, if there are programs and whatnot. So I did share, um, Ms. Jen and I uh, were talking about this particular student uh, so we do have CLI, but with CLI, you know, uh, the ch the student or the individual has to be independent and willing to, you know, learn and navigate. Uh, for this particular student, uh, he is not there yet, and the student may be violent as well. So, you know, those are the things that CLI, CLI here in the CNMI, they just don't have the uh, capacity, you know, uh, to take in those clients who are like violent or they need more, more support. Um, uh, we did have a conversation and I was, uh, you know, sharing with Ms. Jen that, so this student, he loves to draw mm -hmm. and I was like, so these are things we need to explore, maybe not necessarily being employed, but just talking about types of employment that can get that student, like we have uh, the arts council that maybe, you know, you can just start having those conversations. 
about, you know, these are the things that maybe he can be drawing and possibly even sell his, you know, mm -hmm. art or, you know, in that sense. But yes, Michael and Brenda, our teachers are struggling only because we lack the resource here. Mm -hmm. They are also struggling with how do we, what do we write in the IEP in terms of students being at this level? Like, how do we, you know, get there, right? Like, of course, we want goals that we're able to, the student will be able to attain, but in this sense, it's like, that's the struggle right now. How do we go about this? Yeah, and, and I think you do have to look at, and Lucille, you were hitting upon those right things as far mm -hmm. as it may not be a traditional competitive integrated job, nine mm -hmm. to five, 40 hours doing something. Yeah. But work is still work, even if it would be, you know, like a, it, it's almost like a, a, a self business type of thing. You know, he could be, if, if this does gravitate, he really likes artwork. It could also, you know, I, I guess the other thing too, if there are a lot of behaviors, you know, what's triggering behaviors? I think you said um, that, you know, he doesn't really like to be around people with that engaging piece. Well, those are all um, important points to make. Mm -hmm. Then what, like, I, again, taking a step back and looking at what are the pause, like, what can this student do? Mm -hmm. Kind of make your list. You know, these are the things that the kid can do. This is where he is. And then kind of looking at, okay, for the future, what would that look like? Mm -hmm. And it might be support at work. It might be, you know, additional supports in the community. Um, I have worked with students that were even more involved as far as the supports that they needed. Um, you know, we've had students, I've worked with students that really had very limited communication. All they had was an eye gaze and mm -hmm. it was like a 10 second eye gaze. And we'd work on building that up to a 20 second or a 30 second eye, eye gaze. The idea was kind of building on those skills, but then seeing how that could look once that student graduated. So for the transition piece, you can't make stuff up. <laughs> There's not really general goals you can put in there, but you can look at what would make sense for that student. So, I mean, just hitting on, Lucia, what you were saying, you know, it, it could be that the student has an interest in art and pursuing that as a career option when you're looking at their post-secondary employment goal. Mm -hmm. It could be for further training or further engagement in adult, adult life learning. That is something. And then I'm sure for the independent living, their young person is going to need a lot of support. So, you know, live in a community with supports is fine to put something like that in the IEP. It's just it's going to look very different than what you have for some of the other students you're working with. I know that it's a little different, though, in the Mariana Islands than it is like in the mm -hmm. continental United States, because there are a lot of other programs and services. Um, but I think engaging the family, too, in, in what their involvement is with this young person and, and what they're able to do and getting their input is really would be helpful. Um, there is, and I don't know, Lucio or the folks here, if you do anything with person-centered or person-driven planning with any of the schools you're working with? I I believe there is a school. I'm not sure if it was MHS that uses the person-centered planning. Um, but that's something too. Um, and uh, with Susie, I mean, that you may want to look, and there's a lot, there's a number of different ways to do that. One of the most popular right now is called Life Course. Um, it, it, it's it's out of the University of Missouri. It, it, it's something that a lot of states are using, but there's there's other ways of doing that. And basically what this involves is looking at what's the ultimate goal for that student? Um, where are they and how could they get there and look at the supports? And, and it involves engaging the family and other people that know the kid. Um, so that might be something that would make sense. Um, that was I don't know. I don't know how helpful that was, but. <laughs> that actually, Michael, I loved this conversation because I wonder, Lucille, if 
maybe, um, I don't know whether it's going to be in April, Michael, but bringing these examples, a real these real life examples of what you all are kind of some of the challenges that you have with some of these students and talking through these, you know, and beginning to kind of, you know, just have these conversations and hear from your other, you know, colleagues too. Oh my gosh, like I had a student and this is what we did here. You know, I, I just think that there's a lot to be said for, um, you know, the example that Susie brought up, like what would this look like? First of all, transition planning in the IEP for a student like this, what does that look like? Well, how would I write a post-secondary goal, you know, employment and, you know, education goal for this particular student? What does it look like now? I know it may evolve, but what would it, what do I write in there now, you know? And um, then being able to have, you know, when we have OVR a part of this discussion, when should that student be, be referred to OVR? You know, um, what can Connie Lynn do? What kinds of services could she do? What would that look like in the school? Do you know what I'm saying? Really getting down into exactly, um, you know, how could we move forward with this particular student? So I I love these kinds of examples. I don't, I don't know, Susie, if we would come up with any answers, but it, it would sure be great to have these conversations with all of your, your colleagues and experts here for sure. Any other either questions or comments? If not, I want to thank you all for joining us. I'm going to stop the recording. Just give me one second to do that. <clears throat>